church, we believe in God, the one and only true God who sent his only son to die for all of humanity. We believe in a perfect love that casts out all fear. So our mission is simple, to love. Love with no limits, no boundaries, no exceptions made and no corners cut. We believe that only light can drive out darkness and only love can drive out hate. We are a church of sinners saved by grace. We believe that Jesus is not to make bad people good, but to bring dead people to life. So this, this is an invitation to the destined about their destiny. This, an invitation to change history forever. An invitation to join us on this journey as we fearlessly love the city. So I work on the weekends, and I got four kiddos yesterday. They sat me down on my big easy chair, and they said, close your eyes. I said, okay, I'll close my eyes. And they brought me this awesome present. And I just got to show this to you guys because this really touched me. Um, I got four kiddos, and they made a homemade gift. And if you can't see, it's their handprints, and then it's a piece of paper that talks about how awesome I am. But... um, (laughs) I just love this because the, the nine-month-old has the most crisp handprint, and then once they get up to like age six, age 11, it's just a glob of paint. It's pretty amazing. But this is going to go up on my office wall. I love this. And uh, whether you are having a great Father's Day weekend or maybe Father's Day weekend is kind of a tough time for you, I want you to know that in this space you are loved, that you have a heavenly Father who loves you perfectly. And when you receive gifts like this on Father's Day, it makes you as a guy, as a man, want to become a better father. And so I want to encourage the guys today. I want to encourage all of you as we dive into week three of our fearless series. We want to be fearless. So touch someone next to you and say, let's be fearless. So, guys, like movies, the Avengers are in the movie theaters right now. Have you guys seen the original Avengers movie? I love Tony Stark. I love Iron Man. And one of my favorite scenes in the Avengers is when Tony Stark, Robert Downey Jr., goes mano a mano with the big bad guy. The big bad guy is like, I've got an army. And then, you know... Tony Stark drops the mic and says, well, we have a Hulk. And I thought that would be a great message name. Tonight's message, week three of Fearless is hashtag we have a Hulk. Touch someone next to you and say, we have a Hulk? (laughs) We're in 1 John chapter 2. Grab a Bible, grab a Bible app. If you get the free Bible app on your phone, you can click on events and the entire message will pop up on your smartphone. But I've got a Bible. I like big books and I cannot lie. So uh, here we go. First John chapter 2 is where we're diving in. John, we've talked about him. He's in his 60s, 70s, writing to younger Christ followers. So when he talks about children, he's referring to you and I with the affection of an older grandfather in the faith. And so John... Chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, I am writing these things to you, that if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have a Hulk. The Hulk is unstoppable. No one can defeat the Hulk. And John is saying that when we trust the carpenter king and then we make mistakes and the holy God looks down and goes, oh, man, you blew it again. We have a Hulk. We have an advocate. We have a mighty righteous one on our side. He's got our back. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. We like to have advocates in life. When we blow it, when we make mistakes, we advocate for ourselves. If you make a mistake at work and you don't want to get in trouble with the boss, what do you do? You advocate for yourself. When you're growing up and you get in trouble with mom and dad or your loved ones, what do you do? You try to repair it. You try to gloss over it. You advocate for yourself. I remember when I was in high school. Did anybody here do stupid stuff in high school? I am at risk sharing this story because my oldest son is in the room and I don't want him to take notes on this part of the message. So do not follow my example. I was a sophomore in high school, did not yet have my driver's permit, 
but I had a buddy named Corey who did. Corey was a year older, but he was in my grade. He got his driver's license, and he said, hey, John, let's go 10 minutes into the big city. And I said, yes, free from mom and dad. We go to the big football game, and we're cheering against our arch rivals. Did you ever have arch rivals in high school? Imagine you're at their home turf. We're losing the football game. They're winning, and yet we still taunt. We still talk smack. And so they end up winning the game. Me and my buddy Corey, who has a car, has a license, we kind of get into it with a couple of other guys from the other team. You know, just talking trash. You never talk trash, right? Okay, just me. Great. And so my buddy, he's kind of really steamed up, Corey. We watch them get in their cars and drive off. And my buddy, Corey, he says, let's go over to the Walmart. It's open 24 hours. I got an idea. And I thought, hey, let's do this. I'm out on the town, no mom and dad, free ride. We go to Walmart. We go to the dairy section, and we buy a dozen eggs. So we hop back in the car, we catch up with those guys from the other team who we do not like, and we see them getting in their car, so we pull up next to them, and Corey's in the driver's seat, I'm in the passenger seat, Corey rolls down the window, and he mouths, roll down your window. So the guys from the other school, they roll down their window, and Corey goes, hey, that was a great game, wasn't it? And then they start talking trash, yeah, we beat you guys, da 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 we will. and Corey goes, open your mouths. And they go, what? He grabs some eggs, and Corey guns it. Let's go, boom, right? So some eggs have flown into their mouths or something. I don't know. They start chasing behind us. We get to the stoplight. They pull up next to us. They motion, roll down your window. So we roll down the window. And they're starting to, like, grab pens or something to throw at us. Corey goes, do it, John. So I grab the rest of the eggs, boom, throw them. We gun it, right? We squealing tires, we're just jetting down the highway, we feel like we're smoking the bandit, we're the Dukes of Hazzard, dun, 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 dun. we're just zooming down, and they can't catch up to us, because we're breaking speed, li speed limits, don't do this people, we zoom back into our hometown, we're, we're driving through the streets like mad people, we're giggling, laughing, oh we got them, we got them, and then we see them, we see them far back behind us, so Corey's like, let's slow down, I think we got a few eggs left, right, I look down, I go, well, we got one egg, Corey's like, that's all I need. So Corey pulls into a neighborhood, turns off his lights, pulls to the side, and we see them slowly. They, they don't know where they are, and they're looking for us. They're zooming down kind of slowly, and they come, and, and then they, they pull it behind us. Corey's like, I got this. I got this. Give me the egg. So I give Corey the egg, right? And all of a sudden, I become like a Christian. Oh, dear Jesus, please help us, right? And, and they stop the car behind us. They turn off the headlights. They get out, and it's only one of them. The rest must have stayed in the car. So this guy's big jock, you know, bald head. He's, he's walking. I can hear the keys, and we're just, we're just hunkered down in the darkness, waiting with our one little egg, our one little grenade of joy. And it's dark, and we hear the knock, knock, knock on the window. So Corey rolls it down. And as he's starting to bend down, Corey takes the egg and smashes it right into his forehead. Right? And we start laughing. <laughs> Flashlight goes on. It's not the guy from the game. <laughs> oh, it's a police officer. And this is no longer funny, is it? Because this bald police officer, he looks like Elmer Fudd. And he's not saying, where's the wabbit? He says, where's your license, kid? <laughs> and immediately we go into self-preservation mode. Corey goes, it's his idea. I go, no, it's his idea. He's behind the wheel. And we start advocating for ourselves, for our freedom. And Elmer Fudd, he's just not having it, right? He wants to write up a ticket. Isn't it funny when we get in trouble, we will throw our buddy under the bus and we will advocate for ourselves. I was innocent. It was his fault. It was an accident. Yeah, it was an accident that we smashed Elmer Fudd with an egg, right? We get really good at becoming lawyers when we're trying to dig ourselves out of a hole. And the scriptures are clear. First John says, you and I dig ourselves into a hole pretty much every day if we're honest, right? We, we blow it at home. We blow it at work. We blow it in church. And the good news is that we have an advocate. We have a hulk. And why is it that we need someone in our corner when we blow it? Because you and I love junk food. 
some Hostess Twinkies, Ding Dongs, Doritos, some Taco Bell, Fourth Meal. We love to fill our face with junk food. You know why we eat junk food. You and I, we, we participate in grabbing more s'mores than we need or we grab that extra box of popcorn because it makes us feel good. That's why you and I can never stick to a diet at New Year's. Because we are emotional people. And every decision we make in life is based on emotion. So when you see that person on Instagram wearing that outfit, you're like, oh, I want to look like that person. I want to look like her. It's an emotional need. And so we go out and purchase stuff to, to make us feel good. Same thing with food. It's an emotional need. We, oh, I had a bad day at work. And there's a Starbucks. I'll just go through the drive through and I'll get a 1,000 calorie coffee because it makes me feel good. I deserve it. I work hard for my money. I deserve it. Right? We do it because we feel the need to consume something to make us feel good. That's why we consume junk food. It's the same thing with, with junk food in our behavior. We make choices out of our emotional need. It makes us feel good. And so it reminds me of, um, you remember the old Saturday Night Live sketch from the 90s where you had Adam Sandler, David Spade, Chris Farley dressed up as Valley Girls? Remember that sketch? And they're sitting there at the fast food place, and, and they're just casually eating French fries. And Chris Farley goes, well, I'm on a diet. I shouldn't eat. I'll just try one. And then suddenly, you know, the Valley Girl's eating all the fries. And David Spade goes, whoa, whoa, tubby. And Chris Farley goes, lay off me. I'm starving. <laughs> that's a great sketch. And that's how we are with junk food. And with bad behaviors, we, we just kind of sweep it away and say, oh, it's okay if I consume something that's bad for me because I deserve it. And it makes me feel good. And lay off me, I'm starving. And so John, in his wisdom, says to you and I in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, he says, don't love the world. Don't love the junk food of life that weighs you down and puts added weight to your spirituality. And, and he says, if anyone loves the junk food of this world, listen, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he kind of lists out three biggies, three big pieces of junk food that you and I are so often tempted to indulge in. 1 John 2.16, he gives like the unholy trinity of junk food. He says that you and I are pulled towards the desires of the flesh or we are pulled towards the desires of the eye or we are pulled towards pride of life. And what he penned 2,000 years ago still applies in 2018. These three things, listen, 2018, we're Americans. Can we all agree that at some point, especially guys, we are tempted about the desires of the heart, lust. Lust is something that every guy wrestles with. Lust is desiring someone that God has declared hands off. And so we wrestle with that junk food. You know, we see someone and we're like, oh, if I could just get her number. Or if I could just be with that person. Or I'm going to watch this on the internet and it's okay. That's junk food. It clogs up the arteries. Or what's the second thing? If we put the slide back on the screen, John says that the second piece of junk food is desires of the eyes. We innocently watch HGTV and we start to covet. And then we go to Target and they made a name brand out of it. And that's all right. But when we become consumed with being a consumer, John says that, that clogs up. That's like fat in the arteries. It weighs us down, coveting. Or then the, there's the third thing, the pride of life. We see our neighbor and, oh, man, he's got a bigger flat screen than I have. Next time you're in Sam's Club, well, this one's a scratch and dent. I can have the same size. I deserve that. You know, we, we fall so easily into taking more junk food into our lives. And John says that the junk food never truly satisfies us. The junk food keeps us 
from the bread of life. And Jesus said that man does not live on bread alone, but on the very word of God. So junk food is what stifles us in our spiritual growth. You cannot grow if you only eat junk food. If we're only, you know, licking Cheeto dust off of our fingers and never exercising our faith forward, then of course you and I will never be fearless in our faith because we have an unhealthy diet. And then we go to church and you sit here and you go, yes, Pastor John, you're right, I'm such a loser. Tell me how bad I am. Smack me with the holy two by four. That's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to say you're stupid, although you are being stupid. I'm being stupid too. John says we're all being stupid because we all go after the junk food. We just feel stupid. Remember that other SNL sketch from the 90s, the Chris Farley show? I don't know why I'm, I'm on Chris Farley tonight. But remember that sketch where he has his own little TV show and he'll have a famous guest. And then every time he doesn't, like, ask good questions. And so he'll ask a stupid question like, remember that one time when you did that one thing with that one person? And the famous person goes, yeah, I remember that. And Chris Farley goes, yeah, that was cool. Oh, I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid, right? That's not what God wants. He doesn't want you to go, oh, yeah, you indulge in these things. You're so stupid. Like, remember that time when Chris Farley had Paul McCartney from the Beatles? Remember that? Let's watch it. That, it's just too good. Watch this. Uh, remember when uh, you were in the, the Beatles and uh, you did that um, album, Abbey Road, and uh, at the very end of the song, uh, it was, the song it goes, uh, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. You, you remember that? <laughs> yes. Uh, is that true? <laughs> yeah. Yes, Chris. In, in my experience, it is, I find the more you give, the more you get. <sighs> How often do we feel like Chris Farley? You know, we're in the face-to-face -face with someone who is amazing, God. And we're so, you know, unprepared and, you know, we're, we're kind of weighed down by consuming all this junk food. And so we're there with a Paul McCartney with God and we're like, oh, I'm so stupid and he's so awesome. And we just feel like we fail to measure up. That's why John says we have an advocate. We have a hulk. God's not surprised when you and I blow it in life. And the good news of 1 John chapter 2 for all of us is that we have someone in our corner cheering us on. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, he understands all the messes we make. He knows we don't pursue what is nutritious and good for us. And Jesus is not here to weigh you down. He's here to lift you up. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 2. John is a little bit of a poet. And in the middle of this chapter, he writes a poem. He just kind of busts out with this poem. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, hopefully you have a, a Bible app in front of you. He says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Verse 13, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men and women, because you have overcome the evil one. And that's the halfway point of his poem. And then he, he starts over again and says, I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men and women, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. So in the middle of this chapter... John busts out in this poem, and he identifies three types of people in the middle of a poem. And he writes this eloquent poem. He, it's almost like Shakespeare. If I wrote a poem, I mean, it would be something simple, like roses are red, violets are blue, bacon. 
because bacon. But in 1 John 2, he writes this eloquent poem to three different types of people. He writes to little children, young men and women, and fathers. Little children, young men and women, and fathers. And I want to take a just a second to drill down on these three different people because each of us can identify with these three people. And then we'll bring it back to what Jesus does for us. So first he talks in his poem to little children. There's two Greek words that are used. This is kind of a meat and potatoes portion of the message. This is the Greek verbs that are nouns that are used by John for little children. He first talks about technons, which are toddlers. And then he talks about Padions, which are babies. So in the poem, he says little children, toddlers, and then later he says little children, babies. And if you've been around infants and toddlers, they're cute as buttons, they make lots of messes, they scream at night, they have to be fed their milk. And he's referring to us, those who are new to following Christ. He's not talking to literal children, little infants. He says, if you are new to the faith, if church world is fresh in your journey, number one, that's awesome. He welcomes you gingerly as an infant, as a toddler. Oh, how cute. And then he says, yes, you're going to make messes. You're going to try to take baby steps. You will stumble and fall. But that's why the father treats you as an infant and toddler. Not quick to spank, but quick to heal, to love, and to encourage. I have a nine-month-old, little Levi. I was snapping photos with him on the carpet the other day. And I love this kid. Even though I have to change dirty diapers. Even though he doesn't let me sleep through the night always. Sometimes I have to force feed food because he clings to the bottle of milk. But he's cute and I love him, and I know he'll grow if I give him nutrition, not junk food. And so John says to the little children, those of us who are new to the ways of Christ, he says, you need milk. Peter, at the end of his life, wrote a book called First Peter. And in chapter 2, he says, put away the junk food. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk so that you will grow up. When we discover a fresh start with Jesus, the first thing you and I are excited about is forgiveness. Jesus wipes the slate clean for our sins. But that's the starting line of our faith, not the finish line. And if we want to grow to become more like our Heavenly Father, we must crave spiritual pure milk. And we must reject the junk food of life. Because junk food will stifle your growth. But milk from the Father builds healthy bones. It moves us towards becoming young men and women. Which are the second people in the poem from John. Young men and women are folks who have been coming to church for a while. And maybe we have a hard time getting into the scriptures. Maybe we struggle to pray. And so let me encourage you from the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, the writer of Hebrews says, By now you ought to be teachers. You're a young man or woman in the faith. You've been going to church for a while, and you ought to be pouring your life into others, but you're not. You need milk. You're not ready for steak. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is still a child. Solid food, steak is for the mature. Now, for some of us, that may feel like a smack by the holy two-by-four, but really it's an encouragement from Pastor John in 1 John chapter 2. That if you're still struggling with handling the word of God, if you still struggle in your prayer life, it's okay. We're not here to guilt you. Faith is a journey, not a guilt trip. We are here to encourage you, to cheer you on, and to say you don't need to grow up to be an oversized man-child like Will Ferrell and Elf. We all laugh at Will Ferrell, but you don't want to be Will Ferrell. And so in the same way, as you walk in the footsteps of the carpenter king, we want to cheer you on with the word of God. That's why we have a daily Bible reading plan this summer going through the first John. 
That's why we have a midweek Bible study on our Facebook page on Wednesday, so that you can go deeper into God's word, and God's word goes deeper into you. And we encourage you as you take baby steps in prayer and baby steps in faith. And as you crave the steak at the big kid's table, you will become more and more fearless in your faith. And when you and I become fearless in our faith, then we can change the world. And John gives a final word of encouragement to the fathers of the faith, men and women who have been in church world for a long time who have grown in their prayer life and in understanding the scriptures and in living this out. He says to them, the fathers, I write to you fathers and mothers because you know him who is from the beginning. And John in this poem writes to the young children, the young men, and the fathers. But when he talks to the fathers, those who are mature in their faith, he uses the exact same words. I write to you The fathers and mothers who know him who is from the beginning. And so your satisfaction in life will not be found in junk food. But it becomes more fully alive in your heart the more and more you know him who is from the beginning, Jesus. The longer you walk with Jesus, the bigger steps of faith you take with the Father the more fearless you become in life because you know him who is from the beginning. And that's the secret of being a disciple, is to every day take another step forward with the carpenter king. Even when life doesn't make sense, to trust and listen to the voice of God the Holy Spirit. In 1 John chapter 2, Verses 1 and 2, he says, we have an advocate. We have a Hulk. So when the enemy shows up in Tony Stark's apartment and starts mouthing off and trying to scare you and overwhelm you with stress and fear, you can put on the armor of God, the armor of Iron Man, and say, I'm not worried because we have a Hulk. I have an advocate. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And if I may, in bringing this message in for the landing in the final five minutes, can I unpack that word propitiation just for a moment? Because many times we read the Bible and we see a big word and we say, that big word, that's for the, you know, the diehard old Christians. I can gloss over that word. But if we take a moment to dive into that big theological term, propitiation, we'll discover a gold mine. We'll discover why we can be fearless in following the carpenter king. Propitiation is a word that goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 25. Have you seen Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark? I'm excited that tomorrow after I preach at the 10 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. and wrap things up here at the church, I'm embarking on a week-long vacation with my kids. We're going to pack up the minivan and go to that magical place called Up North. I've got my bear repellent, I'm a little afraid, but fearlessly as the father, I will drive that minivan up north to a cottage that a family in the church has lent to us for the week. And we're going to relax and create some memories, and tomorrow night in the little town, the little village we're going to, they're inviting everybody into the town square for an outdoor movie night. We did an outdoor movie night last night, and it was awesome. There's about 200 of us that enjoyed The Incredibles. All you can eat popcorn and we watch the seagulls come and devour our children. It was great. We didn't realize when you have all you can eat popcorn, it attracts everything. And so (laughs) we had the outdoor movie night and it was swell. The kids had a blast. We'll probably do another one in the near future. But tomorrow night there's an outdoor movie night and we're going to take the kids to the movie square because they're going to project on the big screen Raiders of the Lost Ark. And my children need to learn the ways of Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford is a man's man. And if you can understand Han Solo and Indiana Jones, you're ready for life. And so I will (laughs) initiate my youngest sons into the ways of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Indiana Jones pursues the Ark of the Covenant, a real item found in the Old Testament. They didn't have a temple to go to, and so God's people had a portable temple. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. In Exodus 25, Moses says, bring all of your wealth, bring a huge offering, as we'll take up an offering later. 
And out of this offering, they melted the gold. And he's very intricate in how to build this ark. And in Exodus 25, verse 21, Moses, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. So when you watch Indiana Jones, you see the two cherubim, the two angels that are on the top of the ark, beholding the presence of God. And on the top, laden in gold, is the mercy seat. And once a year, they would set up shop, the people of God would worship, and they'd have the Day of Atonement. And at that time, all of the junk food in their lives was laid bare before the Father. They had to come clean. They had to say, yes, we threw eggs at Elmer Fudd. We feel bad about it. And they lay their guilt and shame before the Father so that there can be a sacrifice to wipe the slate clean. And the judgment seat on the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled with the blood of the ram, and it made that seat the mercy seat, so that God's mercy was extended to God's people. And every year, the high priest would make the sacrifice. So you fast forward into the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, verse 5, and it talks about how Aaron, the high priest, is going through this great ritual before God's people. It's a worship service, and they are confessing their sin. They're saying, God, yes, there's junk food in my life. And so in Leviticus, they follow the words written by Moses. He shall take from the congregation two male goats for a sin offering. And so two goats are brought from the people, representing the people of God. Two goats. And one goat is slaughtered. The blood of the ram, the blood of the goat is brought to the Ark of the Covenant and so that in Leviticus 16, 19, it says that he, the high priest, shall sprinkle some of the blood on the mercy seat. Therefore, the judgment of God is satisfied by the blood, and it becomes the mercy seat, and mercy and forgiveness is extended to the people of God. But then it says this in Leviticus 16, 21, that there's a second goat. Aaron, the high priest, shall lay both of his hands on the head of the second goat, the scapegoat, and confess over the head of the goat all the sins, all the junk food of the people. And then they shall send the scapegoat away into the wilderness. The scapegoat that carries the sin of the people leaves the presence of God and is banished from the people of God. And this ritual was carried out every year for thousands of years, all throughout the Old Testament. That's part of the Hebrew faith, Passover, the atonement. Until one Passover in roughly 30 AD, about 2,000 years ago, when Jesus of Nazareth, claiming to be God in human flesh, became our great high priest, as it says in the book of Hebrews. He represents the in-between, between our junk food and the purity of God. The great high priest became the scapegoat. It says that when Jesus went to the cross, the cross was erected outside the city gates. So Jesus was cast out of the holy city of Jerusalem. And that his blood was spilt for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus fulfilled the role of the first goat. Sacrifice for the judgment of God so that we might receive the mercy of God. And so what we see perfectly fulfilled in Jesus is what John says in 1 John chapter 2, that we have an advocate. We have an almighty one, a great high priest, the perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation. He is the substitute for our sins. No longer do we have to slaughter rams and goats. Now we simply trust the great high priest who is sacrificed for our sins. And when you trust him, he becomes the propitiation. He becomes the substitute for you. So that when you and I make mistakes, when you and I have junk food and darkness in our lives, we can boldly step into the light because we have an advocate. His name is Jesus. He has the ear of the Father, and in him we grow from being young children to young men and women to leaders, fathers and mothers of the faith. And that is the great Jesus who makes you and I fearless. 
as we move into a time of worship through song and worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. I want to encourage you to reflect on what Jesus has done for you out of love, that he is now your advocate, your substitute, that the love of the Father shines brightly upon you. Can we pray together? Father, thank you for being a good father. Regardless of our earthly fathers, they are but a poor reflection of your perfect heart. You are holy and just. And through Jesus Christ, you offer forgiveness and a life of fearlessness. Lord, may we lean into the scriptures breathed out by your Holy Spirit. May we turn away from junk food and instead pursue spiritual milk, growing fearlessly in the faith toward the meaty steak. Because God, you are awesome. You are worthy. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.